Hello students, this series of videos is going to be our first in our third unit on the swing era, and this video is going to focus on swing bands. So in the 1930s, the jazz age would come to a close and the swing era would take over. Jazz music became the world's popular music and was called swing. And swing music was played by large dance orchestras and was mostly big band music. As we have mentioned before, the big bands featured sections divided by the instrument. So we have trumpet sections, saxophone sections, and trombone sections, in addition to a rhythm section. Swing music still contained the same elements of jazz and the same balance between written and improvised music. There were two events in American history that the swing era was bound by. The first one was the Great Depression, and the second one was World War II. The Great Depression would begin in October of 1929 when the stock market crashed. This would ruin the banking system and cause millions of Americans to face unemployment. The Democratic candidate Franklin Roosevelt would become the president in 1932 and he would launch the New Deal. Of course, with the New Deal, he would introduce new programs with the intention of helping the unemployed. Progress was slow moving until World War II would turn America into a powerhouse of strength. Although the swing era was happening during one of America's hardest times, it provided a counterstatement to the reality. It became a means to distract people from their daily troubles. It was the first American music that was a young people's music. It was loud and featured an improvisatory flair that, along with the New Deal, helped make Americans alive, alert, and engaged. Swing music would exemplify what America was fighting for in World War II. It was a statement of democracy, getting people from different backgrounds and creating music together. The record companies would face extreme hardship under the Great Depression because spending what little money people had on records that cost a dollar or two just didn't make sense. Plus, music could be heard for free now over the radio. Record sales went from over 100 million in 1929 to just 4 million in 1933. Record labels like Gannett, OK, and Columbia would go bankrupt or were bought out. The only major record label to survive was Victor, and that was because of their union with the RCA radio network. But with the invention of the jukebox, things began to look up for record companies. The jukebox was a record selecting device that made its way into restaurants and bars, and customers could play their favorite songs for only a nickel. So by the end of the 1930s, because of the jukebox, record labels were revived. The three major labels will be Columbia, who was later bought by CBS, Victor, and Decca Records. These three record labels would produce 90% of the recordings Americans listened to. Other forms of entertainment, such as comedians, singers, classical concerts, soap operas, movie and literary adaptations and quiz shows could be found on three major radio networks. Two-thirds of the American public would go to the movies at least once a week by the end of the 1930s, and every week new popular songs would be published from Tin Pan Alley companies. Publishers from Tin Pan Alley would have to compete to get major singers and orchestras to perform their music. Jazz music would become popular music by being heard in a soundtrack at the movies or on a radio broadcast or on a restaurant's jukebox or maybe performed at a nightclub or theater. As more musicians began competing over jobs, the standard of what it meant to be a good musician rose. Jazz musicians now were expected to play their instruments flawlessly, sight read effectively, and improvise convincingly. Dance bands would pay a respectable salary and offer steady work. They became one of the few skilled crafts available to the African Americans. Although the majority of the dances were invented in black ballrooms and the call and response heard in the orchestras came from black churches, most of the money from the swing era went into white pockets. Many black musicians would feel like their music had been stolen because of this. So swing music would become the perfect music for dancing. It would contain a groove that featured a steady, unaccented four beats to the bar foundation. This was a similar groove heard on the records from artists like Louis Armstrong, but when Duke Ellington released the anthem, 
it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, the four beat groove would become the standard for hot dance music. This swing dance style would first appear at New York's Savoy Ballroom. The ballroom, which opened in 1926, took up an entire block in Harlem. The guests would go inside by a marble staircase, and once inside, they would find fancy wall decorations, thick carpet on the floor, soft benches, round tables for drinking, and of course, a long polished dance floor. The Savoy would be able to host battles between two bands, each setting up on opposite sides of the hall. The band that would most often be associated with the Savoy Ballroom was the band of drummer Chick Webb. We'll talk about him in a later lecture. So the Savoy, unlike the Cotton Club, would open its doors to both white and black customers, although most of its business would come from the African Americans living in Harlem. The new dance that came from the Savoy was called the Lindy Hop. This dance was named after Charles Lindbergh, who would successfully fly across the Atlantic in 1927, which proved to be a triumph for youth and ambition in the Jazz Age. The Lindy Hop dance was a more African-style dance being lower to the ground and requiring more hip and knee flexibility. Unlike the dances from the 1920s, like the Foxtrot or the Waltz, the Lindy Hop allowed for improvisation from the dancers. The best Lindy Hoppers even added new steps called air steps where they would gracefully throw the female over her partner's shoulders. So as bands were adjusting to swing music, we'll see certain changes were being made to the rhythm sections. The drum sets would still have the bass drum providing the four beat pulse, which is just what it had done in most cases throughout the 1920s. The tuba, which was commonly used in the jazz age because of its clear sound on recordings, would be replaced by the upright bass. And the bass had been a crucial element of the New Orleans rhythm section because players would slap the strings with their right hand to provide a more percussive sound. Tuba players began to switch to the upright bass at the end of the 1920s in order to keep their jobs. The banjo would be replaced by the guitar for the more subtle timbre it gave off. The guitar was as much heard in the rhythm section as it was felt. The guitar would play chords on all four beats in a chunk, chunk, chunk kind of style, and the sound of the guitar, bass, and drums as the rhythm section had a sound that rippled through dance halls. Now, arrangers would also apply changes to the way they arranged to fit the new swing style. They would write complex melody lines for entire sections of instruments that were harmonized in a block chord style. And playing in block chords just meant that multiple people were playing the same rhythm, just with different pitches or different melody notes. And this creates a much more dense harmony. Arrangers called these block chord sections soli. That's S-O-L-I. Also in the swing era, arrangements would develop spontaneously from oral practice. So musicians would take improvised riffs and harmonize them on the spot. And these were called head arrangements because they come from the player's head. So band leader Fletcher Henderson, who we talked about throughout the 1920s, would become the most representative arranger of the swing era. His arrangements would sometimes combine both written and head arrangements, as well as rhythmic swing and melodic simplicity. Henderson's arrangements would feature short, memorable riffs in call and response style, with brass sections responding to reed sections for dramatic effect. He would write a few choruses out in written arrangement form and leave the other chorus sections up to the band for improvisation. The final chorus of a Henderson arrangement was called a shout chorus and would be climactic and known for ending in an ecstatic wail. The first song we are going to listen to in this unit is Henderson's track Blue Lou. This piece was written by the saxophone player Edgar Sampson who played with Henderson's band. It was then arranged by Henderson's brother, Horace, who made the focus on the soloist Roy Elridge on trumpet and Chew Berry on saxophone. 
This song was recorded in 1936 and follows a 32-bar pop song form. The song begins with a two-note riff, and the saxophones are heard playing in a soli in the first chorus, so those block chords, while the trumpets are heard playing a soli in the fourth chorus. A loud drum stroke signals a change of keys going into the fifth chorus, and it's believed the form of this was flexible. So they're listening for that drum stroke. The trumpet solo in chorus four could have continued on for numerous choruses until that drum signaled the entrance of the fourth chorus. The next swing era figure we are going to talk about is the famous Benny Goodman. So the 1930s would be just as racially divided a society as we've seen before throughout this course. Hot music, as it was called, was said to be the black specialty, while white musicians were expected to play polished dance arrangements in performance and to save their hot playing for after-hours jam sessions. Benny Goodman, however, would be the one to change this. So Goodman would grow up in the slums of Chicago to an immigrant family from Warsaw. From a young age, he showed enough talent to get out of the manual labor his father was doing. He would be an elegant soloist by the 1920s and would have a strong appreciation for playing the blues. This would make him different than bandmates often more inclined to jazz. He would meet Louis Armstrong and hear him perform in Chicago in 1926. He would then eventually move to New York and form a band that bridged the gap between hot jazz that he wanted to play and the commercial jazz that he was forced to play. He would take the advice to get a Harlem book of arrangements from the vocalist Mildred Bailey. He would also hire some of the best underemployed black arrangers in the business, such as Benny Carter, Edgar Sampson, and of course, Fletcher Henderson. Benny Goodman's band would get featured on the radio program from New York called Let's Dance in 1935. This broadcast would feature sets from three bands, and Goodman's band was the featured hot orchestra. They would go on last after most New Yorkers were already asleep, so they didn't believe themselves to be well known. After this radio program was on its last legs financially, they would embark on a national tour and the reception of Benny Goodman's band would get worse and worse with every stop they made. It got so bad that management suggested they cancel the rest of the tour, um, but Benny Goodman's band pressed on through. And at the Palomar Ballroom in Los Angeles, they would begin by playing one of the conventional dance numbers that the ballroom managers had insisted on. After getting puzzled looks from the audience, Goodman decided if his band was going down, it would be while playing music they cared about. He called for one of the Henderson arrangements and the room went wild. What they hadn't taken into account is while they were performing at a time slot when most New Yorkers were asleep, it was airing in prime time on the West Coast. So the new audience Goodman had found for his swing music was mainly white teenagers. By the time Goodman returned to New York, his band was the hottest commodity in show business. His band would incorporate the latest pop songs with swing music. The first chorus would be recognizable enough for 10 Pan Alley companies, and it would then follow with jazz-filled elements. One of the biggest accomplishments of Goodman's band was bringing jazz music to New York's Carnegie Hall in 1938. And that's going to conclude our first video of this series. In our next video, we'll talk about some of Goodman's songs and his smaller ensembles.